difficulties with our Harriet Tubman lecture. I hope that we can get this situated. Uh, we should be going live now. And I hope if anybody's watching this, you can comment in the comment section so I can see if you, you got this and then I'll continue. I have Angela Crenshaw here to get going. We were had already started before I realized we had this technical difficulty. So this is my fault. I, I'm so sorry, everybody. Um, all right, so I'm just texted some people. We are changing where this look. It's still on YouTube, so we should still be go happening. Um, let me see what is going on on a different channel. And we are live. Yep, we're live on Historic St. Mary City. Sorry, everyone, I'm chatting with Dr. Travis Parno, who's helping me out with this, um, making sure we get this information out to people. Um, and we'll get started very shortly. No one is watching right now. Oh my goodness. Let me type a message in if I can. All right, is this, we got one person watching. All right. Hopefully they can type us a message. Looks like someone named Nixian typed in. All right, you're welcome, Nixian. <laughs> we got four more people coming. I'm sorry about this. I thought I had this all squared away. So um, we will get this moving along very quickly. Jeffrey Lee just typed a message too. Yes, Jeffrey, this is recording right now and will be recorded and saved on our actual channel. So I apologize. And I'm just. Um,
wait for a few more people to get going. I am trying to get the link set up. All right, let me see if I can get the link um, put in the old um, chat. That's where I'm having an issue with, with doing this, so I apologize. All right, I just got the link set up on the older chat that it was supposed to happen on. So I, you should be going soon. All right, people are starting to see it on the other post. And we have a nice comment from Michelle Atkins. I visited the Underground Railroad Visitor Center in Dorchester on spring break with my family. Thoroughly enjoyed it. Very good, very good. All right, so we got up to 12 people. And hopefully that works out for people. We'll give it a few more minutes and then I'll reintroduce you <laughs> okay i am so sorry it happens All right, we're up to, to 16 people. I'll give it a few more minutes and then we'll officially begin again, as far as we're concerned. And for everybody else who was patiently waiting uh, on the other link, um, I do apologize. That was my fault for and um, for getting things a little mixed up on my end. Um, so we got more people coming over. I posted the link. And I'm going to go ahead and get started, um, if that works for everybody. But this was a very important day, historically speaking. It is uh, officially now a federal holiday to celebrate Juneteenth, a day in which uh, many people were finally freed from bondage of centuries of racialized enslavement. And for us at Historic St. Mary City, that's especially important because that enslavement process began and was codified into law in 1664 at St. Mary City. And we know of evidence of a man named Antonio, that's a European name, who resisted in the 17th century, the first documented person to res resist their enslavement. And it wasn't until the American Civil War and President Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation that all those people who were enslaved in the states of rebellion, I should note, not Maryland, not Delaware, not Kentucky or West Virginia were allowed, uh, were given this, this freedom. It wasn't until after the Civil War, when for Maryland in 1664, the state constitution was rewritten that banned race-based slavery. So in Maryland, it was codified into law for 200 years. And one of the most important and influential and famous people to resist enslavement and help other people is Harriet Tubman. And so it's apropos that we on this day have a lecture on Harriet Tubman with park ranger Angela Crenshaw, who, who um, is so kind to be here with us today. 
Uh, Angela started her work with the Maryland Department of Natural Resources in 2008, uh, helping to remove abandoned boats and debris from boating surfaces. She became a Maryland park ranger in 2016 and promoted and was promoted up the ranks uh, through her time at Elk Neck and Gunpowder Falls State Park. By 2017, she was the assistant manager at Harriet Tubman Underground Railroad State Park and beautiful historic Church Creek, Maryland. Ranger Crenshaw received her master's degree in energy and Envi environmental policy from the University of Delaware. And working at Harriet Tubman Underground Railroad State Park allows uh, Park Ranger uh, Crenshaw to celebrate this history of Harriet Tubman and share it with people and the importance of it. Uh, Park Ranger uh, Crenshaw Angela, I should notice, is now currently working at Gunpowder State Park as an assistant manager there. But more importantly, she is working with the Park Service um, in helping to engage and interpret difficult histories, something that uh, many of us in our cultural heritage areas are trying to do and justly and make it an equitable storytelling process because this is very important. And uh, I think on a day like today, we can really see how those ramifications of things that happened 400 years ago, 200 years ago, yesterday are impacting our lives today. And so without further ado, Angela Crenshaw, thank you for coming. And I apologize for the delay. No problem. Thank you very much, Peter, for that lovely introduction and for inviting me here today. Hello, everyone. My name is Ranger Angela Crenshaw, and it's an honor for me to celebrate Harriet Tubman's life and legacy with you all on this beautiful day. Harriet Tubman lived to be 91 years old, and today I'll be sharing her formative years spent on Maryland's eastern shore with you. It was here that she lived, loved, toiled, and learned the skills that made her into a world famous underground railroad conductor. All the images that you will see are from Dorchester and Caroline counties, which are the lands that shaped young Harriet. After my presentation, I'll do my best to answer any questions you may have. Now, let's start at the beginning. In late February or early March of 1822, Harriet Tubman was born in the town of Tobacco Stick, which is now known as Madison in Dorchester County on Maryland's Eastern Shore. Her parents, Ben and Rit Ross, gave her the name Araminta, but she went by Minty for short. As you can see, Southern Dorchester County is a place of great beauty and absolutely amazing splendor. However, the horrors of American slavery were a daily struggle. Enslaved people had no rights under the law and were treated as property, the same as livestock or furniture. Young Araminta was born into the system of bondage and often rented out to cruel and negligent temporary masters. From a very young age, she was separated from her family and required to do domestic labor, such as cleaning, cooking, caring for small children, and checking muskrat traps during the dead of winter. The image you see on the left is called the scourged back. I'll describe it more shortly. The middle image is an advertisement to sell or rent enslaved people along with inanimate objects such as rice and grain. The image on the right is a slave coffle, which is enslaved people who are chained together by their wrists and feet so that they could be transported without risk of flight. It should be noted that this is an image of Washington DC. The scourged back shows a man named Gordon. He was enslaved in the South and survived a horrific beating in the fall of 1862 that left him with very visible physical scars. As he recuperated, he plotted his escape. In March of 1863, he fled enslavement and after traveling 80 miles, he joined the Union Army. This image was taken after his extensive scars were discovered during a medical examination. It was used by abolitionists to show the horror of the peculiar institution known as American slavery. It was published in Philadelphia, New York, Boston, and London, and used repeatedly by the famed abolitionist William Lloyd Garrison. With regards to American slavery, Harriet Tubman said, slavery is the next thing to hell. If a person would send another into bondage, he would send him to hell if he could. Young Minty's earliest memory was that of being a child. She said, the first thing I remember was lying in the cradle. I remember lying in there, when the young ladies in the big house where my mother worked would come down and catch me up in the air before I could walk. At about the age of five, young Harriet was tasked with caring for her younger siblings while her mother worked. She recalls the baby began to worry or cry. 
So she cut a piece of pork, warmed it in the coals of a fire and put it in the baby's mouth and that she indeed did soothe the child. However, when her mother returned home from work, she saw the piece of pork hanging in the baby's mouth and thought young Harriet had killed the child. But in fact, she had succeeded in soothing her sibling. I like this story because it shows from a very, very young age that young Mincy had to think on her feet and it also shows her love and her compassion. While just a child, young Mincy was rented out to the Cook family. She was tasked with checking muskrat traps on the Little Blackwater River. The marshy wetlands of Dorchester County was the ideal and still is the ideal habitat for muskrats, which are semi-aquatic critters that burrow in the soil and dine on aquatic vegetation. She was required to set the traps on the banks of these streams where they build their domed houses. This would have been very, very difficult for a young child. She had to traverse the harsh, swampy, and unfriendly landscape in the winter when the muskrat pelts are their thickest and finest. Muskrats are also known to be foul-tempered and very difficult subjects. During this time, young Harriet came down with the measles and was still forced to traipse around in the cold water and check these traps. Eventually, her mother convinced her owner to allow her to rest and recuperate. When she was just an adolescent, young Harriet received a horrific head injury that nearly killed her at the Bucktown Village store. She accompanied the plantation cook to the neighboring store to pick up some things for the house. However, she said that her, she had been working all day and her hair stood up like a bushel basket. So she put the shawl over her, of her mistress over her head to cover her hair. When she went in the store, there was a runaway slave and a slave catcher. The slave catcher looked at young Harriet and said, grab that slave. However, young Harriet said no. The slave catcher picked up a two pound weight and meaning to hit the runaway instead threw it and hit young Harriet right above her eye. She said the last thing she could recall was him raising his hand to throw the weight. Young Harriet was taken next door and sat on a loom chair where she bled and bled and bled. She said it cut a piece of the shawl clean off and drove it into her skull. She also said you could take three fingers and stick them into your, her skull up to the first knuckle. That's how deep the scar was. She received no medical coverage, and instead the next day she was tasked with working in the field, but she said she couldn't because she was bleeding and sweating into her eyes. Eventually her mother convinced her master to send her home to rest. However, while she was resting, her master tried to sell her because she was earning no money for him. And she said eventually when her master couldn't sell her, he looked at her and said, you're not worth a sixpence. The incident at the Bucktown Village store was horrible for Tubman's health, but amazing for her faith. She heard choruses of singing voices. She had vivid dreams and felt that she had a direct connection to the voice of God. Based on her symptoms, it was likely that she was suffering from temporal lobe epilepsy or TLE, one of the side effects of which is being devoid of fear. This would serve her very well in her life and later in life during her journeys of mercy on the Underground Railroad. Of Tubman's faith, Thomas Garrett said, I never met with any person of any color who had more confidence in the voice of God as spoke to, directly to her soul and her faith in a supreme power truly was great. Thomas Garrett was a famed abolitionist and Underground Railroad station master who worked out of Wilmington, Delaware. He held Harriet in high regard and was a devout Quaker. So him speaking about the faith of an enslaved African-American woman truly spoke volumes. The images you see here, or of Malone's church. Now Tubman did not worship here, but is very close to where camp meetings or spiritual revivals would have been held and also very close to where she spent her childhood. There are Tubman's buried behind the church, most likely relatives of her first husband, John. Harriet preferred the relative freedom of being outside to that of domestic work, which is done under the watchful eyes of petty and often vengeful mistresses. She began to work in the timber fields with her father, Ben Ross, who was a highly respected timber foreman. She would have been one of a few, if not only the only woman working there, cutting timber, hauling wood, driving oxen, and she said doing all the work of a man. She lifted huge barrels loaded with goods bound for market and pulled heavy laden boats through the canal system like an ox. She said she could cut half a cord of wood a day. She hauled logs and was reportedly the marvel of her master, who would often exhibit her feats of strength to his friends. This was quite substantial considering there was no heavy machinery and all this backbreaking labor was done by hand. 
It was around this time when young Araminta was in her 20s that she married a free man named John Tubman. She changed her name to Harriet, perhaps in dedication to her mother or for religious reasons, and she took his last name Tubman, making her Harriet Tubman. It was here in these timber fields that she learned the skills necessary to become a successful conductor on the Underground Railroad. Skills such as foraging for food, traversing harsh landscapes, being comfortable outdoors, and physical and mental strength. Tubman was very proud of her physical strength and her knowledge of the outdoors, particularly in these work assignments that were traditionally assigned to men. She claimed to have loved great physical activity. The image you are seeing is by Mark Priest, and it shows Stewart's Canal being built. The canal was dug by hand by crews and carved out of marshland from Parsons Creek all the way to the head of the Blackwater River. Canals such as this one were used to supplement the many natural creeks and streams throughout the county and to increase access to the timber fields in the interior and take their products to small shipyards and eventually larger ports like Baltimore. With canals, the difficult task of hauling white oak, walnut, and pine was somewhat alleviated as these products could be floated to market. Free black maritime workers, also known as blackjacks, provided information about safe houses and routes on the Underground Railroad, and a, they were also a network of communication between ports and the neighboring communities. They also taught young Harriet how to read the sky and navigate by the stars. This is a skill that they use for their livelihoods and one that she would eventually use to free herself and her people. If you visit Dorchester County, Maryland today, Stewart's Canal still exists, little change from its original configuration. This map shows Dorchester County, Maryland and its districts and cities. Tubman was born in Tobacco Stick, which is now known as Madison in the Parsons Creek District which is also where Stewart's Canal is located. You can see the canal here. She was moved to Bucktown when she was a child, which is right over here. And the timber fields of Dorchester County are located here with their sturdy white oak used for ship keels and white and yellow pine. She would have had an intimate knowledge of this landscape as she was required to travel between these areas for work and to see family and friends and to attend church and camp meetings. The waterfront towns, of Church Creek, Wolford, then known as Milton, and Tobacco Stick, now known as Madison, is where these valuable timber products were taken to be processed into shingles, staves, boards, and wood pulp for shipbuilding. It was in these waterfront towns where Tubman met the Blackjacks. Of her early years, Harriet said, I grew up like a neglected weed, ignorant of liberty and having no experience of it. I was not happy or contented. Her education was not received in a classroom, as it was illegal to teach African Americans how to read during that time, but it came from her mother, her father, her family members, and the community where she lived on the eastern shore of Maryland. The geography of Dorchester County with its wide tracts of timber, swamps, tidal marshes, creeks, and inlets provided cover for freedom seekers and eventually Harriet Tubman and her charges. In 1849, Minty and her brothers Ben and Harry attempted to run away, but disagreed on the route so that they so they turned around and came back. This is the runaway notice from that attempt that shows the $100 reward for each of them upon their return if taken out of state. The runaways were to be returned to Eliza Brodus near Bucktown, Maryland in Dorchester County. According to this ad, young Minty was 27 years of age, chestnut color, color fine looking and about five feet tall just like your favorite ranger. However, Tubman's owner continued to live well beyond his means and was in financial trouble. During that time in American slavery, Tubman and other enslaved people were considered to be property. Tubman feared she would be sold. Her sisters, Lina, Mariah Riddy, and Soph were sold south, never to be seen again, and Tubman did not want that fate for herself. So in September of 1849, Tubman took her liberty. She ran away from bondage at Poplar Neck in Caroline County, this time on her own. Traveling mostly at night and following the North Star, Tubman made her way north. She used her connections on the Underground Railroad for shelter and forage for food. She finally made it to freedom in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. 
Oh, freedom, she said. When I found I had crossed that line, I looked at my hands to see if I was the same person. There was such a glory over everything, and the sun came like gold through the trees and over the fields, and I felt like I was in heaven. Whenever anyone asks me what freedom is, I share this quote with them. Freedom was wonderful, but it was nothing without her family. She said, I was a stranger in a strange land, and my home, after all, was down in Maryland because my father, my mother, my brothers and sisters and friends were all there. Tubman found refuge in Philadelphia where there was a strong and very supportive community, and she did domestic work to earn money for her journeys of mercy. What was freedom without those you love? Using the Underground Railroad, Tubman returned to the Eastern Shore of Maryland to rescue about 70 family members and friends and people she could not live without. She said, but I was free and they should be free. I would make a home in the North and bring them there, God helping me. The image you see is by Jacob Lawrence and it shows Tubman pointing at the North Star and guiding her charges through the wilderness to freedom in the North. In addition to her own self-liberation, Harriet completed 13 trips on the Underground Railroad. In spite of its name, the Underground Railroad had no tracks, no trains, and no cabooses. It was a resistance movement against slavery through escape and flight. Free and enslaved Blacks, as well as white supporters, provided food, shelter, transportation, and direction. Also known as the Liberty Lines, the Underground Railroad used railroad vernacular as co coded language for the individuals involved in the migration of African Americans to freedom. Those who coordinated escapes were known as agents. Guides were known as conductors. Established stops were known as stations, and those who managed the stations were known as station masters. And freedom seekers were known as passengers or cargo. Tubman not only emancipated family and friends, but she also provided directions and instructions to many others who made the journey of freedom too. She proudly said, I was the conductor of the Underground Railroad for eight years, and I can say what most conductors can't say. I never ran my train off the track, and I never lost a passenger. Harriet preferred to travel during the winter when the nights were the longest and the sky was clear. She and her party of freedom seekers could travel at night and rest in hiding during the day. Tubman said she could tell time by the stars and find her way by natural signs as well as any hunter. She used the outdoor survival skills she learned in Dorchester County to conduct herself and others to freedom and away from bondage. <clears throat> Harriet also used the call of an owl, <clears throat> excuse me, to alert freedom seekers if it was dangerous or safe to come out of hiding and continue their journey. It would have been the barred owl, or as some people call it, the hoot owl. It makes a sound that some folks think sounds like, who cooks for you, who cooks for you, who cooks for you, who cooks for you all. The barred owl and its call is ubiquitous on the eastern shore of Maryland and would not have been would not have stood out as odd if it was heard by a passerby in the wooded areas. She also inspired a piece by Robert Hayden called Runnegate Runnegate that I've committed to memory. Hoot owl calling in the ghosted air, five times calling to the haunts in the air, shadow of a face in the scary leaves, shadow of a voice in the talking leaves. Hayden also refers to Tubman as a woman of the earth, and I couldn't agree more as she used her knowledge of nature and the landscape to improve the lives of her family and her friends. Tubman's final journey as a conductor on the Underground Railroad was in the winter of 1860. She intended to rescue her sister Rachel and her two children, but upon arriving in Maryland, she was heartbroken to find out that Rachel had passed away and she wasn't able to get Ben and Angerine for want of $30. She spent the night waiting hopefully in the woods However, it was during a blinding and raging snowstorm, so she protected herself as best she could behind a tree. But she knew that slave patrols and slave catchers were monitoring the countryside, and any time spent waiting in place would increase her risk of being caught. She decided she couldn't wait any longer, and instead of wasting a trip, she took the Enos family as her passengers. Stephen, Maria, and their three children started towards Wilmington with Miss Tubman as their guide. Tubman brought the family to a home of an established Underground Railroad station master. But when she knocked on the door, she found that he had been obliged to leave for harboring runaways. Finding herself caught off guard, Tubman hurried the runaways into the outskirts of town, where she found a small island in the middle of a swamp. The tall grass offered the ideal camouflage until they could move forward. 
They waded to an island and they carried the baby in a basket. They were hotly pursued, but found deliverance in the form of a Quaker man in his wagon. They continued their journey and then they hid in the landscape that Tubman knew so well. She secreted the, secreted the family in the woods during the day and foraged for food. They eventually made their way to Wilmington, Delaware, and then to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, where they were given food, clothing, and money. They were no doubt appreciative of Tubman and her knowledge of the outdoors for their survival on this very treacherous journey to freedom. But Tubman's personal war against American slavery did not end with her journeys of mercy on the Underground Railroad. During the Civil War, she was a nurse and a cook by day and a spy and a scout by night. The landscape of South Carolina looks very similar to that of Southern Dorchester County, as they are both, they both contain tidal marshes, creeks, canals, and lowland forests. Tubman used her knowledge of how to travel this landscape during her time as a spy for the Union Army. Then on June 1st, 1863, Harriet Tubman became the first woman to lead and execute an armed raid during the Civil War. She joined Colonel James Montgomery, the second South Carolina colored troops and a few from the third Rhode Island battalion on the Cumbie River raid in South Carolina. They started at Port Royal and chugged 25 miles up the Cumbahee River in three steam powered gunships named the John Adams, the Harriet Weed and the Sentinel. The purpose of the raid was to disturb the Confederate supplies. They opened sluice gates and flooded rice fields ruining that season's crop. They burned down plantations, homes, and they confiscated corn, cotton, and rice. They also destroyed the pontoon bridge at the Cumbahee Ferry, severing a key transportation route. Then on June 2nd, Colonel James Montgomery ordered the steamships to sound their whistles. This was the signal to the enslaved people to run towards the boats for their freedom. Some were reluctant, but Tubman noted that they soon realized that Lincoln's gunboats had come to set them free. Men, women, and children grabbed what they could and ran towards the boats as angry overseers and plantation managers tried in vain to stop them. In all, about 730 people were emancipated that day during the raid. There wasn't a single ca casualty on the Union side, and the event was also a boon for the Union Army, as Colonel Montgomery gained 100 to 180 men in his regiment. However, my favorite aspect of this event was the fact that Tubman stayed behind to help those newly freed people. She understood the need for assistance and support when transitioning from being enslaved to a free person. Tubman said, most of them coming from the mainland are very destitute, almost naked. I'm trying to find places for those able to work and provide for them as best I can, while at the same time they learn to respect themselves by earning their own living. Park guests were often curious if Frederick Douglass and Harriet Tubman knew one another. Indeed, they did. In a letter to Harriet Tubman, Douglass wrote, the midnight sky and silent stars have been the witnesses of your, free your devotion to freedom and your heroism. Meaning that what Douglass did to fight American slavery was done during the day. And what Tubman did was done during the cover of darkness because she was still herself a runaway. It should be noted that they were both born on Maryland's eastern shore and worked tirelessly to abolish American slavery. Later in her life, Harriet purchased a home in Auburn, New York. She adopted a daughter named Gertie with her second husband, Nelson Davis, and Tubman took in and cared for anyone who was in need. She attended conferences and meetings in New York and Massachusetts and fought for women's right to vote. She was also an active member in the AME Zion Church at Auburn and collected clothes for destitute children and, and in support of her community. She had a garden and a brick building business and she was well known around Auburn and she's even recorded as having made a remedy for colicky babies from items from her garden and the surrounding woods. In 1896, she purchased a five acre lot with the goal of achieving her dream to open a place to care for poor and sick African Americans. Within months, she had incorporated the Harriet Tubman home. Tubman struggled to raise money to keep her dream alive, but she continued boarding people at her home, including young children. Then in 1908, the Harriet Tubman home for aged and infirm Negroes officially opened. She had finally achieved her lifelong dream. Tubman's health began to decline, and eventually she had to use a wheelchair for mobility, and then she was confined to her bed. In her late 80s, she entered the Harriet Tubman home that she had fought so hard to open. 
This is where that picture was taken, one of the last images of her. On March 10, 1913, Harriet Tubman passed away at the age of 91. Before she slipped into a coma, she said, I go away to prepare a place for you, that where I am, you also may be. She's buried at Fort Hill Cemetery in Auburn, New York, next to her brother. I find it incredible that Tubman did, that Tubman began acquiring her expertise as a child while doing what she had to do to survive. I find joy in thinking about the knowledge and the skills that she had to have in order to achieve the impossible. I'm inspired by the love and the light that Harriet Tubman shared with those around her. And I aspire to be as caring and knowledgeable about the outdoors as she was. If you'd like to take your experience further, I suggest reading the book Bound for the Promised Land by Dr. Kate Clifford Larson. She's the park's historical consultant, and all the exhibits are based on her efforts and research to document Harriet Tubman's life. I'd like to thank Historic St. Mary City and Peter for inviting me here to talk Tubman today. It's an honor and a privilege to be able to share her life with you all. I hope you feel inspired by her life spent tirelessly fighting for freedom, and I hope you have an understanding of how her formative years spent on Maryland's Eastern Shore shaped her into both a heroine of freedom and the ultimate outdoors woman. Once again, thank you. And at this time, I'll do my best to answer any questions you may have. All right. Thank you, Angela. You're very welcome. This is great. Um, we'll get some questions in soon. Um, and again, my apologies for the technical difficulties, everybody. Um, but this will be recorded and, and will live on our YouTube channel, so you can always come back and watch it again. Um, a couple of things that, that struck me as, as you were talking. One was when we did our test, um, and, I, and I just, I, I think it's really important to bring this up, is Gordon. Um, that is the first time I ever heard his name. Uh, was when you and I were uh, chatting on our um, initial test run of this. And it's a, a picture that is in millions of elementary school textbooks, middle school, high school textbooks, everywhere in history that, that deals with this topic and yeah. uh, was used by abolitionists quite frequently. Yet even the abolitionists didn't use his name. and. I'm just wondering what um, why you think people didn't use his name. I have some guesses, but I would like to hear from you. Um, and then can you tell us the process about finding out who he, his name? Sure. So I can only guess why people might not have wanted to use his name. Um, that image is very personal. Um, his shirt was off. He took his shirt off for something completely different than to have that image taken. It was for a required training, excuse me, for a required examination. Um, so the fact that he agreed to pose for that image um, said a lot about him and him, his willingness to share his plight and how he made a mess into an inspirational message. Um, that might've been a part of it. And some of it might've also been ignorance. Um, I know there's a lot of images that were used um, from American slavery and it, 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 it just had a random, it just said slave at the bottom, slave from Louisiana. Their, their, their names and their agency was, was taken away from them. Um, and I know Frederick Douglass um, felt the same way. He said he didn't know his birthday the same as a calf in the field would know his birthday. And if you notice at the beginning, I said Harriet Tubman was born in late February or early March of 1822. She didn't know her birthday. And we only know her birthday range because Dr. Kate Clifford Larson found a receipt for a midwife. And that's the only way we know that she was um, born during that time and during that year. Most enslaved people only knew harvest time, uh, winter. So again, taking away your birthday and your name was another way to remove your agency, was to remove your identity and make you even less of a person and more of a piece of property. Um, and so the way I found his, his name is that image is used in one of the introductory, introductory videos at the Harriet Tubman Underground Railroad Visitor Center. 
uh, it flashes up on the wall and the image is kind of cropped. It doesn't include the back of his head. So I made it a point to find the one that showed even his head was misshapen from the beating that he endured. Um, I thought that was really important to include. That was Those were all of his injuries. Um, and I figured people started asking me questions. And when I was at the park, if one person asked me a question, okay, maybe that was a fluke. But if two or three or four people asked me a question, I better be able to answer it. So um, it was a young child that asked me more about that picture. And I said, young man, while you do your tour, I will do my best to find out as much as I can. And we had a lot of resources at the park. I'm very thankful for the Maryland Park Service for that. They let me read and purchase as many books as I wanted for the park so that I could answer people's questions. And I remember seeing it in a book and I looked it up and I was able to explain that his name was indeed Gordon. Uh, he ran away from slavery in the South, traveled 80 miles, joined the army to fight for freedom because he thought it was just that important, even though his, his back had been scourged and ruined by American slavery, but he still wanted to fight for his freedom as well as ours. Um, and so that's how I found out Gordon's name. And so now whenever I show that image, which as you said, is used everywhere, I make sure to use his name. It gives him agency, it names him, it makes him more than a piece of property. Yeah, and, and it's a tribute to, like you said, everything he did and all the struggles he did in running away and, and to fight and ensure freedom for you. Um, I had a second question, but I'm going to hold because there's a couple that popped up in the chat. And so I want to let our, our guests come up. Um, and this one is about the recent discovery. Um, can you talk a little bit about the major discovery a couple months ago of Harriet's father's home? Yes, excellent question, Michelle Atkins. Um, Tubman's ho father's home was really important to find because that's where she would have grown up. It would have been surrounded by those timber fields that I was mentioning. And um, so that discovery was made by uh, State Highway, uh, SHA, Maryland State Highway Association or administration. I always get them mixed up. I apologize. Um, they have a team of archaeologists and they're very, very well funded. And I'm sure you're wondering why SHA has archaeologists. And it's because before roads are put in, they have to do archaeological studies. So they have these teams that go around and do these studies. And so SHA was contracted and worked with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, who owned that land, to try and locate um, where Harriet Tubman's father's home was. And I think one of the most interesting aspects of that is it is in a very, it's in an upland forest, which is impressive in Dorchester County because it's very swampy and low. So the access roads to that are very low, but once you get there, it is preserved. Um, because it's on upland forest. The first two images that I showed you are as close as you can physically get via water to that site. So you've actually seen very, very close images. Uh, and then the image of Malone's church is the closest you can get to that site without trespassing. So Malone's church is a part of the Harriet Tubman Underground Railroad Byway. And if you go there, you are not very far from that site. Um, so they're removing artifacts from that site and working on uh, a document to put together for that site. And I hear that they do want to open it up for uh, visitation. They just have to make sure the access road <laughs> is clear and usable um, all year long. Um, and it's just a very, very meaningful site. Um, I remember when they started working on that and, and thinking about what that would mean. And to Harriet Tubman, someone that was moved around and forced to move around as a child, that land was very important because that was her homeland. That was her home where her father lived, um, very near those timber fields that I was showing you. So that's why it's super, super important to find that site. Um, they also found the Liberty coin there. If you go to the press release, I believe you can see a picture of it. And um, they found where they believe that house was. There's some um, infrastructure there. And what I find also most interesting is the land is still being uh, used the same way it would have been used in Tubman's time. Um, I've seen map images and there's, it's just a cutout just like that. Absolutely perfect. And it would have been about the same in Tubman's time. And I'm also very thankful that it's owned by Blackwater National Wildlife Refuge. Uh, they have over 20,000 acres, so they preserve that landscape. Uh, which allows us to tell Harriet Tubman's story um, because you can walk in the landscape and experience what it would have been like uh, during her time without seeing commercial buildings and um, condominiums and things like that. So they preserve that landscape, uh, which I'm very, very thankful for. 
and we are all about preservation here. At <laughs> so we can agree with that. And teamwork, yes. <laughs> yes. It takes a lot of people to do this type of work. All right, so we have another great question. Did Harriet Tubman have uh, later health issues related to her head injury? She did. Um, that injury plagued her for the rest of her life. Um, if you look at images of Tubman, that first slide I had was all the images we have of Harriet Tubman. And if you notice, her left eye is always a little bit droopy, a little bit more hooded. That's from that. Um, she would have splitting headaches. There are sections of her life where she was missing, where no one can account for her. And she was most likely uh, recuperating from that and suffering those uh, injuries. Um, and she would also fall into these really deep uh, lethargic sleeps where she would wake up and she wouldn't be rested. It wasn't restful sleep. Um, there was a story where she was being interviewed um, by someone at a suffragette con conference and she was speaking to the person and all of a sudden she stopped and fell asleep. And moments later, she woke up again and continued the conversation as if nothing happened. Um, and she was also very open about her head injury. Um, she would tell her uh, passengers before they went on a journey, I have these fainting spells, I'll fall asleep, but God is with us and we'll be just fine. So I love the fact that she was really open and really upfront about her head injury. Um, she also, not just from the head injury, but she received a, uh, a beating when she was just a child, one of her cruel mistresses tied a rope. Uh, they would tie knots in the ropes. And she snuck up, snuck up behind Harriet and hit her in her lower back. And then later in life, Tubman was showing um, some of her relatives these scars. And it basically looked like she had a broken rib from childhood that was never repaired because she had a massive knot in her back. And she said, but I never gave them uh, the pleasure of hearing me scream. So she was always very strong and very resilient um, and also very open about her, her head injury. That's another important thing that I think oftentimes um, gets left out of, of history is, is, is people who do suffer um, or I shouldn't say suffer. That's not a great a good use of that word. Um, endure. Endure. Live or, or and people who have various um, disabilities, um, physical or cognitive, and you know, um, versus people who are able-bodied in our, our lives um, and our history you know, for this country, you know, has always been you know able-bodied white males, and now we're in this process of making sure that it's not just that story is being told. And so Harriet kind of like. You know, like looking at a Venn diagram, she's covering a lot of bases right there. She um, does. So that's a really important part of that story. Um, and, and another one I think is as caretaker. I think that's uh, maybe something that people don't always associate with Harriet. And this is, leads us to our next question is, uh, do you happen to know what women's <laughs> recipe that Harriet promoted for helping with colicky babies asking for a friend? Uh, hi, Travis, asking for a friend. Uh, I'm not sure. It just said she got some items from her garden. Then she walked into the woods and came out, came to her home and created the recipe for colicky babies. Um, so I'm not sure uh, the exact ingredients. And people ask me that and I, I'm, I'm trying my best to find out. Um, and what you said, uh, Peter about Tubman covering a lot of uh, aspects. I personally love the fact that to me, she's the ultimate outdoors woman. She did all of this outdoorsy, naturey stuff. And I just, I loved it. And she used it to change people's lives. And she was um, always very positive and very kind. Um, I really, what really speaks to me besides her outdoorsiness is what I call the softer side of Tubman. She had a close relationship with her father and her brothers and her mother and her sisters. And I just, that warms my heart because I think people think of her as this six foot tall superhero, but she was just a five foot tall woman of color with a head injury that knew in her heart that American slavery was awful and she did everything she could to fight that. And so that's the aspect that I love to highlight and I love seeing it in the visitor center as well. Well, I want to take a little, we have two more questions that just came up and, um, but what you just said, that was going to be my second question hmm. and, and touching on her outdoorsiness, you know, yes. being outdoors woman. Um, I, I love being outdoors. I've, I've gone camping. I'm starting to take my kids out camping more. And, and sometimes that's not something you always associate with Harriet Tubman or, 
other people in that time period, but they, they are a part of nature. And I think we in our modern times are very removed from nature and the cycles of nature and how things work. And people were new, you know, when you spend a lot of time outdoors, you, you get to understand what the animals are doing, what the plants are doing yeah. and their cycles. And that gives you a lot of information and respect for everything that's outside, but also yourself. And uh, maybe that would be a challenge for people over this weekend as, as we celebrate, you know, in the Juneteenth, but also remember maybe it might be a good time to take some personal reflection and go out into the wilderness to honor Harriet and just sit there quietly and, and think about that. I couldn't agree more. Go to a state park. There you go. There's yeah. lots of them. Lots of them. Um, all, open. all right. So we, uh, Mia Bloss asked a good question. It is, what are the sources for her life narrative? Were they collected at the end of her life? Hi, Mia. Very good question. Uh, she had a few biographers. Uh, Franklin Sanborn recorded um, some accounts of Tubman's life, as well as, oh my goodness, I just lost her name. It'll come to me. Sarah Bradford. Sarah Hopkins Bradford also published her biography. Uh, it should be noted that when she published that, she was publishing it to fund uh, Harriet Tubman's life. Um, so she kind of rushed it. She was also uh, leaving the country, so she wanted to make sure it was published before she left the country. And then she republished it again. So in rushing, um, there's some fabrications in there. Like she says, Tubman emancipated 300 people. She exaggerated that as well as a few other aspects of Tubman's life. Um, and then there's a lot of her accounts um, going speaking at suffragette conferences. Um, and that's where the quote about the Underground Railroad conductor comes from. And most of Tubman's fame came when she was much later in life. Um, she had to keep what she was doing very secret and very quiet. Uh, and I know Kate did a lot of research. And when I asked her about where and how she found that, uh, orphans records as well as deeds. Um, Tubman's first owner passed away and so enslaved people were passed along after people die, kind of like livestock and furniture, anything that you would deed to someone. And that's been the best way to um, find her accounts. And then, like I said, later in life, she would tell her family and friends a little bit more about her life and share things um, when she was uh, up north. That's a good question. Yeah. Next is another good question and I, and I imagine this is going to be also a very hard one to, to understand mm. have an answer to uh, from jeffrey lee how much do we know about the people she rescued visiting her again um the people she rescued visiting her again um what do you mean visiting her again i guess i don't understand the question yeah. i mean do we know much about any of the people she rescued Sure. Um, yes, yes. Um, traveling on the on the Underground Railroad was time consuming. It was expensive and it was very, very dangerous. So you wouldn't just walk up to someone that you didn't know and say, hey, do you want to go on an illicit illegal journey this evening? Um, so she only took people that she loved and trusted and couldn't do without. Um, she emancipated her parents uh, when they were elderly. Um, she came back. That was one of her few journeys she did in the spring. She heard that her father was going to be reprimanded for being an agent on the Underground Railroad. So she came back and she built, she knew her parents couldn't walk the over 100 mile distance to freedom. So she built a cart and put them on the back, uh, let them grab, they each grabbed one of their favorite things. Her father grabbed his favorite axe and her mother grabbed her favorite um, feather tick or bedding. And she put them on that wagon. She took a horse and she took them to freedom. Uh, she emancipated her brothers as well. Uh, as well as a few other relatives and some young children. So these were all people who knew Harriet Tubman, um, people that she she wanted up north um, to join her in freedom. Um, when she got there, she said she felt really lonely, so she had to come back for those that she loved as well so that they could um, enjoy freedom and be with her. So it was mainly family and friends. And that kind of speaks to something I, I remember reading I think it was involving her father, or mm -hmm. I mean her stepfather, um, who was viewed as a very honest man. And I yes. think uh, if he knew he was going to come in contact with Harriet at some point, would make sure not to look at her. So yep, that way, if he, was, 
asked if he saw her, he could say no. Yes. So when she came back for her brothers, it was Christmas. Um, and that was very intelligent on her part. And I'm sure planned because during certain holidays, Christmas, uh, Easter, you could go visit family and friends, even if you were enslaved. Um, so she told her brothers to meet her at Poplar Neck, which is where her parents were living at the time. Uh, one brother had uh, his a partner had just had a child. So that was, I'm sure, a very difficult decision to leave that child and his um, partner. But they met at Poplar Neck. Um, her mother was known for being pretty excitable. So she did not want her mother to see her or her brothers because she knew her mother would start screaming and shouting and run up to them and hug them as any mother would. Um, so they hid in a corn crib and they could actually see through the slats of the corn crib, they could see their mother um, and she would go in the house and stir the food and prep the food and then go out and look on the porch and smoke her cigar and wait for her kids to come home and then go back and forth and do that. So they could actually see their mother worrying because they weren't there. Um, and so her father brought them some food. Um, he put a cover, a bandana over his eyes when he brought them their food. Um, and then he actually walked them to the gate as well and waited till he couldn't hear footsteps anymore and took the bandana off. That way later when someone said, did you see Harriet? Did you see your sons? He could say no and not be accused of being lying. He could do it with an honest and truthful heart. So that is very true. I like that story. Um, yeah, me too. Yeah. We got another one from Cody asks, um, it's two questions sort of, um, in a way. How was Harry able to survive traveling through winters, um, especially with, with her head injury, which, you know, that, that's a good question. It's a fabulous question, Cody. Thank you for asking. Um, Tubman knew uh, and felt she was guided by God. So anything she was doing uh, was divine. So she knew she wouldn't fail. Um, later in her life, uh, during her, one of her journeys of freedom, she prayed for deliverance and she expected an answer and knew she'd receive an answer because uh, this was Harriet Tubman talking to God. So um, it was through her faith. It was also through uh, her knowledge of the outdoors, where to hide and when, um, how to protect herself. Um, and she also received some help. Um, people would uh, give her clothing to wear, um, one of the really important things I learned uh, with folks traveling on the under Underground Railroad, when you're traveling through the countryside, especially South Dorchester County, it is muddy and gross. So you're covered in mud. Whenever I'd hike in the woods, I'd be covered in mud at least up to my knees. Uh, and that was no problem for me. I was out there for work or for fun. But for an enslaved person, you couldn't walk into a city like Philadelphia covered in mud and soaking wet because then you would look like exactly what you were which was a runaway. So it was really important to have that change of clothes. Uh, I've also mentioned Thomas Garrett. Uh, he was a station master in Wilmington, Delaware. He has an amazing story. If you look him up, he's super inspiring. But one of my favorite aspects of his life is he is a cobbler. And who else do you want on your team when you have to walk over 100 miles to freedom but someone who can make you shoes? And one of the first Thomas Garrett stories I read, he had actually welcomed Harriet Tubman and some of his some of her passengers to his house and she had completely walked the shoes off of her feet. So he gave her and the entire crew brand new shoes. So uh, Harriet Tubman had a great team on her side uh, with the Underground Railroad. Um, and She got a lot of um, help through the Underground Railroad as well as working really hard to save up and um, for these for these journeys because when you're walk in and traipse in through the woods, you can't work, um, but you have to have food and gear and everything for your, your charges and for your passengers. Um, so some of that was sheer will, some of it was divine providence, and some of that was the support of her crew, as I call them, the original team Tubman, which is what we used to call them at the park, uh, the other Underground Railroad. As uh, I like how you describe that and, and really thinking about what happens when someone goes into the city and how they look and mm -hmm. how to think about one's appearance and planning and prepping for that aspect of, of it. Uh, because even though, and, and this is probably another thing that many people might not realize that once runaway uh, enslaved people got to a town like Philadelphia, which was quote free um, in the North, 
by law of the Constitution, people had in, in those places like Philadelphia and New York were obligated to capture and return them to wherever they came from. Yes, especially after 1850, which was the third Fugitive Slave Act. If you saw someone that you thought was a runaway, um, if you didn't take them into custody, then you were indeed in trouble yourself. So it made that journey even more perilous, which is why a lot of uh, enslaved people and even free people made the decision to head north all the way to Canada to purely get their freedom. Uh, there's a town in Ohio, it was an African-American town, and they all decided after the Fugitive Slave Act was passed to pick up and move to Canada. They abandoned their town and moved all the way up there so that they would not have to worry. Wow, I, that one I didn't know. Uh, I, I apologize, I have to look up the name of the town. Uh, it's in a book that is up in a box, <laughs> and I just have to take it out of that box. But yeah, yeah. Um, So those accounts were, were frequent, which is why Tubman uh, spent a lot of time in uh, Canada West, also known as Ontario, mm -hmm. and why there's a large African-American population in Canada to this day. In that part of Canada, right? Mm -hmm. So, and, that, and that's, you know, there's a lot of heritage there in Canada with like Nova Scotia is another place where uh, people who joined the British Army during the American Revolution to seek their freedom or during the War of 1812, which we know we have some uh, evidence of that happening here. Yeah. yeah. Um, we're, we're given uh, land and, uh, up there. So that's a common thread throughout. Mm -hmm. um, and and I think also kind of speaks to some of the things that people don't always realize about the Civil War, some of the misconceptions about the Civil War. But like when you read um, the acts of secession from various states, that's one of the main things that they point out of why they're seceding is because the northern states or people in the north aren't in um, fact uh, following runaway slave um, slave acts not at um, all easy to do it. Mm -hmm. so the the the, the session, secession states are like well you know we entered into this this constitution we're all supposed to be following these laws but you free states aren't following the laws so we're going to separate um and and i think when you read those it, it really makes it seem different than you know it was about taxation or states rights it was um really about following those laws there's way more to it yeah and um the other interesting thing which i didn't know about harriet that you brought up that i knew about frederick Douglass, um which is also an interesting tie is, is women's suffrage and and how she was involved in the women's suffrage movement and how these two groups of people um women uh white women who were who were trying to get suffragettes not all of them but a few of them were also abolitionists and, and trying to get that passed and, and many uh, runaway or freed uh, former enslaved people were supporting with suffragettes. And it's kind of Very like cool. freedom needs to be for everybody. Yes, yes, there was a lot of overlap there. And I, I love that about them. Don't just do it partially, do it 100%, do it fully. And and then in that regard, you know, because we were supposed to do this lecture last year, which was the anniversary of, of women's suffrage, yeah. it should be noted that that law didn't apply to all women. Right. Not initially, no. <laughs> and Tubman passed before she was uh, given the right to vote as well. I think that should be noted too. And that she passed after the the amendment was passed allowing white women to vote, but then African American women weren't allowed to vote till later. Or later. And Native American women, even later. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. yeah. So it's 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 been a struggle for a lot of people, but this is a I think a good story and and hope for everybody i don't see any more questions mm. i don't have too much more to say um other than thank you very much for for sharing this wonderful story on this very important day as we head into uh i think a historic weekend for our country and hope that we can all think um, and reflect about what juneteenth means to many of our fellow citizens Yes. Thank you all for your time. Again, Peter, thank you for hosting me. And I hope you all have a wonderful and impactful June t June Juneteenth celebration. All right. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.